We're back with episode 18 and thanks so much to Hunter Killer for sponsoring this video. Today we're looking at the latest batch of space fascists and this lot may seem eerily familiar. It's the first order and the final order from Star Wars. You obsessed over the original trilogy, either shrugged or raged through the prequels, but now comes time for all of your prayers to be answered, because J.J. Abrams is here to monopolize his grasp on epic space-based franchises by sprinkling his soft reboot pixie dust all over Star Wars. Prepare to be bewildered by The Force Awakens, a film absolutely packed with things that are technically Star Wars, shored up with a hefty framework of shameless fan service. But don't get too misty-eyed just yet, because The Last Jedi takes a complete 180 turn after contrarian Johnson comes strutting in without a plot outline to spoil your childhood memories with rancid alien milk, sending a normally mild-mannered Mark Hamill into berserker mode. The sacred Jedi text! and forcing a desperate JJ to wheel out the big guns in the finale, which unsurprisingly makes an even bigger mess. But at least Chewie finally got his medal. So with a casual approach to franchise planning, causing a grand total of two canonical resets within the space of three movies, an incompetent empire of a different ilk undertook a retcon blitzkrieg in the form of TV shows, books, comics, and visual dictionaries in a futile attempt to cover every inconsistency. Wondering how Finn saw the Hosnian Cataclysm from a planet in a different star system? Starkiller created subspace tears which allowed everyone to view the event magnified and in real time from anywhere in the galaxy. Galaxy. Duh. Wondering how Kylo got all the way from the Death Star wreck to Exegol in an old Imperial TIE fighter not equipped with a hyperdrive? It was simply a Scout class TIE that was never mentioned until now. Uh, nope, we're not gonna be buying into all of those. We're asked to empathize with Rey, a new Jedi for a new age, last name conspicuously unknown. As usual, we first encounter her eking out a meager existence on a desert planet, but unlike the more developed Tatooine, this desolate world is almost devoid of civilization, yet it's apparently still equipped with all the resources one needs to become absolutely awesome at everything. Rey's a self-taught scavenger, turned mechanic, turned pilot, turned linguist. You can understand that thing? Turned soldier, turned gunner, turned master Jedi. They fly now? They fly now! Turned Jesus, turned Palpatine, turned Skywalker? Very impressive considering the only help she got along the way was some nefarious genetics, a few harsh life lessons from Master Grimm, and some modest training from a former casual hours Jedi. So you just know this girl is going to be far too much for our incompetent Empire fanboys to contend with. Bet she gives great helmet. They may technically have bigger balls, but in many ways the First Order are just Galactic Empire light. Point 1. A New Order of Stupidity so after the Emperor's downfall and Return of the Jedi, a group of Imperial Loyalists made their way into the unknown regions and utilizing infrastructure left by Palpatine slowly conducted a massive military build-up, reorganizing themselves as an autocratic military junta and annexing many systems within the unknown regions They eventually became a new version of the Empire known as the First Order. Lacking their predecessors' manpower and resources, they've been forced to focus on quality rather than quantity, supposedly seeking to rectify some of the errors of the old order while embracing the empire's authoritarian and ethnocentric ideals. Sure, they've made a few token diversity hires, but aliens are still second class citizens, unless you're gonna count mutant meat puppet Snoke as an alien. While they do maintain technological superiority over their enemies on paper, the first order is still afflicted by a range of issues, some new and some familiar, and their so-called improvements over the empire are for the most part superficial. Their training of stormtroopers and pilots is now supposedly far more intensive, with more focus on adaptability and counterinsurgency, though how effective the result is a matter of debate. Even stormtrooper armor is supposedly better, but I don't see the point of that effort if their armor still doesn't seem able to ever withstand or deflect incoming blaster fire. First order TIE fighters are said to be superior and even come equipped with a hyperdrive, but that won't be enough to stop them from being dashed against the walls in tight space spaces while larger rebel craft have no issues. At least the First Order do seem committed to improving their vehicles. By the third movie, they appear to have created a class of TIE with not only a hyperdrive, but hyperspace tracking as well. Wait, do we believe this? 
Their new horse mechs are still slow and still only able to fire forwards. But they haven't been skipping leg day, so I assume they could now withstand a basic tension cable. Maybe. The First Order takes the Empire's bigger is better mantra to new ridiculous extremes, taking the same inherent risks that come with the hyper-centralization of power and resources, first with Starkiller and then with their mobile capital, the Supremacy. As usual, the trouble with concentrating so many resources in one place, it ends up being an obvious target for your enemies and a gargantuan loss when it goes. Though at least this time, the First Order did take some precautions to avoid losing their entire leadership. And Starkiller, like the Death Star before it, has the additional downside of being a rebel creating super weapon as well as a planet killing one. Even before its creation, the First Order wasn't exactly ingratiating themselves to their conquered planets by continually harvesting their young people to fill their ranks. Like the Empire under First Order rule, you're given the stark choice between subjugation, death, or a shot at freedom with the rebels. In terms of workplace culture, things are pretty much worse than ever. The First Order are plagued by a typically vicious, violent ruling class, but now, rather than being incompetent yet still intimidating, they're literally a joke, like bad parodies of Imperial officers. You and your friends are doomed. We will wipe your filth from the galaxy. Now you see that evil will always triumph because good is dumb. These dudes seem way too emotionally invested in everything. But it's not surprising these people would develop anger issues since they're living in a climate of fear and under constant threat of death. Stormtroopers probably have it the worst, being highly expendable, stripped of their names and treated like slaves. Luckily for them, they haven't been programmed well enough to prevent them from rebelling. But things get really dysfunctional within the officer class. As usual, problems don't receive structural fixes, only a patsy to take the blame. Taking initiative, delivering bad news, or simply interacting with your commander could see you severely punished. People aren't encouraged to work with each other, but against each other. Making cover-ups, complacency, infighting, poor practices, and disloyalty inevitable. Like the Empire before them, the First Order operates under a confusing military hierarchy where high-ranking officers can have their orders countermanded by the special powers afforded to Dark Side apprentices who exist outside of the traditional military command structure, only answering to the Supreme Leader after the course of action has already been taken. With no clear line of succession, any time a Supreme Leader bites the dust, the First Order would de-evolve into Rule of the Strong. You'd be extremely lucky to be left with an intelligent commander, let alone one with sound leadership abilities. They aren't prerequisites. So it comes as no surprise that the First Order's operations are plagued by poor decision making, causing mistakes, oversights, and other more colossal errors. For an empire that prides itself on order, these guys are more than a little disorganized. Point two, the First Order's leadership is full of short-sighted, incompetent thugs. So after years of hiding in the shadows, the First Order are finally ready to start their campaign to retake the galaxy. And in terms of timing, things really couldn't be any better for them. Because at this point, the New Republic is extraordinarily weak. With a somewhat corrupt Senate ground to inaction, they've written off the First Order as a benign Imperial remnant, massively underestimating them. They've drastically reduced their military and left their remaining forces underfunded and inadequate. They've ejected the troublemakers like Leia, leaving the only force willing to stand against the First Order, a ragtag group of volunteers who don't have official Republic backing, putting the First Order in a weird but dominant position, in which they're acting as the statist aggressors, fighting a modest guerrilla force of New Republic citizens. So with their enemies in such a sorry divided state, the First Order should surely be able to crush the rebels easily. Uh... When we first encounter them, they're hunting for a map piece that leads to Luke's Skywalker and surprise surprise it's been hidden in a resistance droid, immediately hinting at how weak their regime must be since one aging Jedi in exile is regarded as an existential threat to them. If Skywalker returns, the new Jedi will rise. This time, our rogue, unaccountable commander is Kylo Ren, a guy with some serious granddaddy issues. Obsessed with living up to the mantle of Darth Vader, he unwittingly ends up channeling a bitchy, immature Anakin. You are so right. Though he didn't pay enough attention to his granddad's career to understand that if he wants to maintain any intimidation factor, then the helmet must stay on. 
when he's not moping around his quarters or staring pensively into his grandfather's skull. He's throwing temper tantrums, making rookie errors and overruling other First Order commanders with the sheer threat of violence. Hux is also a low quality inadequate leader but it doesn't matter as much because he can't make many decisions anyway. His vulnerable position forcing him to focus on one-upping Kylo Ren and bootlicking the Supreme Leader over any other concerns. So we're left with an emotionally unstable Kylo Ren in charge on a personal quest for respect and recognition. It's safe to say his decision making is more than a little problematic. First off, Ren seems to sense there may be an issue with Finn. He even knew his serial number. The one from the village, FM2187. But he doesn't report his concerns to Finn's commanding officer or at least ask someone to keep an eye on him, clearing the way for Finn to escape with Poe from right under their noses. And so the First Order loses the greatest stormtrooper they've ever had, a soldier actually capable of hitting targets. Or maybe he can finally see now that he's ditched the helmet. Emo then lets his personal beef with Luke get the better of him by fixating on capturing BB-8 going against the specifics of Snoke's orders. Supreme Leader Snoke was explicit. Capture the droid if we can, but destroy it if we must. They should have no problem retrieving the droid. Unharmed. Careful, Ren, that your personal interests not interfere with orders from Leader Snoke. And poor Hux, devoid of space magic and with questionable authority, can do little to challenge him. Snoke then orders a devastating attack on the capital system of the New Republic using their nifty new toy, Starkiller. Not that we really care, we didn't even know these people. I'm sure that won't do much for the First Order's popularity though. They finally catch up with BB-8 on Forest Cantina Planet, but let's not give them too much credit, because our vacant good guys have been wheeling this wanted droid out in public wherever they go. Are we really doing this? Once Kylo arrives, he makes the foolish decision to abandon the search for BB-8 after becoming infatuated with this girl, seeming to believe his forced telepathy is so infallible it will allow him to print out a detailed map from Ray's brain like a printer or something. Pull the division out. Forget the droid. We have what we need. A short-sighted move which allows the map piece to fall into rebel hands, the more serious concern according to Snoke. And of course Ren ultimately fails to get anything but a few feels from Rey after throwing her on his torture rack. We ain't found shit! But not to worry, Snoke isn't even concerned about this massive era. Ren believed it was no longer valuable to us. They may have the map already. Then the resistance must be destroyed before they get to Skywalker. Ren witnessed for himself how innately powerful with the Force Rey is. She is strong with the Force. Untrained but stronger than she knows. It wouldn't surprise me if she could crush these restraints with her mind or mess with the control panel. Or does she not know the magic hand wavy thing for that? Yet Ren leaves her alone, inadequately restrained and unmonitored except for one weak minded stormtrooper. So with a blossoming Jedi loose on Starkiller and a bunch of pissed resistance fighters on their way, the First Order looks set to continue the Imperial tradition of getting their biggest and best stuff blown up easily. This time there isn't an exhaust port or a weak reaction Reactor, but there is still a solitary target that will destroy the entire thing. The resistance are also helped along by other factors, including a dodgy shield vulnerable to hyperspeed incursion, facilities that seem easier to bust into than ever, and a cowardly Captain Phasma, who finally gets her big moment when she caves immediately to Finn and deactivates the entire Starkiller shield grid. I'm not sure an X-Wing sortie was the right choice considering the size of the target, but it sure ends up being enough, along with some explosives. Meanwhile, Ben gets one last jab at the old man before it's time for a bit of hack and slash with our good guys. I will give Kylo one thing, his lightsaber is pretty alright. It's not exactly a terrible idea to have a crossguard on your laser sword, but that won't stop him from being embarrassingly nicked by a lowly stormtrooper who swings around a lightsaber like a baseball bat and then bested in a duel by an untrained force user. But let's give Kylo the benefit of the doubt. He was already injured, he's still developing his powers and he probably hasn't received much training. This could be the first proper lightsaber fight the guy has ever had. His biggest mistake was thinking that pounding on his wound was a good idea. Ha! He's insane. It's also likely that Kylo already has an unhealthy crush on Rey, so he wants to run her through on his own terms. Can you feel that? 
Not to mention, Snoke technically wanted her alive, and she isn't one to be easily subdued. So the problem here isn't so much Kylo's lack of skills or his confused motivations, it's the fact that such an immature, conflicted young man has been given such authority and sent on such important missions. But I know none of you guys suffer from such failings. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to hunt a killer. When Beth Ferris Hendrick's death is declared an accident in the small town of Mallory Rock, Maine, her sister Gwen sets out to prove Beth was murdered. To catch the killer, she'll need your help to expose her hometown and uncover the secrets of Mallory Rock. Sign up for Hunter Killer and each month you'll be sent a box full of documents, evidence, case files and audio recordings to examine. Use your investigative skills to eliminate suspects and identify murder weapons until you uncover the truth and crack the case. There's more to Hunter Killer than solving a murder. The game creates an ongoing narrative in which you'll learn about the backstories of each of the suspects and their complicated relationships to the victim. Enjoy a story that develops further with each new episode. Hunter Killer isn't just a a subscription service. There are plenty of other mysteries waiting for you on their website, many of which can be purchased as an all-in-one experience. When I play Hunter Killer, I really enjoy sifting through all the documents, taking notes on all the suspects and their potential motivations. This game is not like anything I've played before. I found it more immersive and compelling than typical board games. I was especially impressed with the design quality of all the items. So guys, if you're ready to put your detective skills to the test, go to HunterKiller.com com slash zealot and use the code zealot to receive ten dollars off your purchase do you have what it takes to hunt a killer one Chewbacca ghosting later and we're on to the last Jedi. And thanks to the power vacuum created by the Hosnian Cataclysm, the First Order has made some serious galactic gains. We jump in on another rebel hunt, but with only a handful of ships and 400 or so resistance fighters left in the entire galaxy. 400 of us on three ships. For the very last of the resistance. Well, I mean, it's pretty much over already, isn't it? How could the First Order not win at this point? They're not off to a great start with the supposed fleet killer ship, the Dreadnought. Apparently, Poe's X-Wing is too close and too small for these surface cannons to be effective, which leaves me wondering what the hell they're even for. That puny ship is too small and to too close range. We need to scramble our fighters. Five bloody minutes ago. And for some reason, they failed to deploy their smaller fighter craft until just now. With the heavy duty auto cannons primed and ready to go, they don't fire on the nearby rebel fleet. No, they fire on a rebel base, which is about to be abandoned forever. We then discover the First Order doesn't have the monopoly on poor ship design. It's the most ridiculously impractical rebel ship in existence, a space bomber. Almost all are rightfully destroyed, but just one ends up having enough firepower to take out this entire dreadnought. As usual, this dreadnought has what amounts to a self-destruct button exposed on its exterior. And did someone forget to install shields on this thing, or...? One nifty piece of technology the First Order develops is their game-changing hyperspace tracking ability. Not too bad if it didn't gift us the most underwhelming space chase in existence. With the Rebels unable to go to hyperspace without being tracked, and with the huge First Order ships unable to achieve adequate sublight speeds, the First Order seem to believe they've been left with no choice but to pursue the resistance ships until they run out of fuel. What is the point of all this? if we can't blow up three tiny cruisers. Suffering from a lack of imagination, there seems to be numerous solutions to this issue. They could continue to send their smaller, faster ships to engage them, which they do to great effect for a time. Red, the resistance have pulled out of range. We can't cover you at this distance. Return to the fleet. <laughs> Uncharacteristically, Ren and Hux seem concerned about cover for their pilots, but the supremacy should be packed with smaller vessels and human cannon fodder. Or better yet, send some Star Destroyers into hyperspeed ahead of the Resistance fleet and then come back to cut them off. They've had a long time to think about all this, yet they're acting like they're completely out of options. They also seem to have difficulty detecting smaller ships, allowing Rose and Finn to take off for a pointless casino junket before they dress up as the most unconvincing First Order officers ever, infiltrating the supremacy for another pointless mission. At this point, they just seem to be doing it for fun. The First Order also don't notice when other small rebel ships start breaking away towards this planet. Sensors. When they should have been able to spot them with a simple telescope. But the kicker, they had a means of detecting smaller ships all along, they just needed to be told it might be necessary. So we checked on the information from the thief. 
We ran a decloaking scan, and sure enough, 30 resistance transports have just launched from the cruiser. It appears they've configured their telescope to scan for them. Back with the supposed good guys, we discover they're not devoid of atrocious leaders themselves. This arrogant, condescending vice admiral is nothing short of a villain, withholding vital information, causing hostility and dysfunction. I'm not sure if we should call her vice admiral of gender studies or vice admiral with Holdo. Yeah, we'll be putting her up for a vote. And let's not give her too much credit for a kamikaze run. A droid or a computer program could have pulled this off. Congrats, you just threw your life away for nothing. In fact, the rebels should probably just stick with this tactic going forward. I'm sure you could defeat all kinds of balls and gargantuan ships with an autonomous hyperspeed missile. The First Order fleet just became obsolete. Meanwhile, Snoke woefully underestimates his apprentice, but of course, thanks to a later retcon, he ends up being beyond criticism. His final task may be to bait Kylo into killing him. The seizing of the Sith throne by Kylo representing the completion of his training training in a half assed way of satisfying the rule of two. So Kylo throws Snoke on the cannon dumpster fire where he belongs, seizing the role of supreme leader. It's time to let old things die. The Sith, the Jedi, the rebels, let it all die. Grandiosely declaring an end to the old order and then immediately setting out to finish off the rebels. This guy seems more confused than ever. Blow that piece of junk out of the sky! All fighters! Now burdening the First Order with the full weight of his emotional baggage, weakening his position just to destroy an old rust bucket, then falling for an obvious ruse, allowing the Resistance time to escape, all for the sake of a pointless personal vendetta. But as bad as Kylo is, there's an even bigger bad lurking in the shadows, someone who makes Ren's errors seem juvenile by comparison. Point 3. The Final Disorder so we jump back into the finale to find Kylo Ren raging after a mysterious message from the long dead Palpatine emanates across the galaxy, and it's soon confirmed that the former Emperor is indeed back on the scene. I knew it! No, you did not. But it wasn't much of a reveal because it had previously been spoiled beyond measure in a cringeworthy Fortnite promotion. The day of the Sith. Yep. I was wrong, you were wrong, George Lucas was wrong. Somehow Palpatine returned. So I guess Anakin's sacrifice is pretty much worthless now. No! But surely since Sidious is announcing himself to the galaxy, he must be 100% ready to take on whatever comes, right? Uh. Apparently part of the Emperor's contingency plan, Palp's dark Sith spirit whisked itself away to inhabit this half-baked clone body on Gothworld Exegol. Should have called the Kaminoans for this job. I mean the dude was always ugly, but now he's looking like a zombified husk of his former self. His cataracts are worse than ever, and he can't even stand up by himself. And what kind of crappy clone would have the facial scarring from your last body? It's just very hard to understand you with all the... In the extended canon, we're also asked to believe that these Sith ghouls are actually real people who have been building these ships for years and apparently partaking in a never-ending Sith orgy, filling all their ships with their degenerate dark side offspring. D did you do this? And then magicking up a whole bunch of Sith troopers from somewhere in a part of the galaxy that should have already been well harvested by the First Order. I found it slightly more believable when I thought these ships were conjured out of nothing and manned by a legion of Sith ghosts, but to each their own I guess. Palpatine seemingly lost control of the First Order the second his puppet Snoke was taken out, leaving a power vacuum to be filled by an immature, disloyal Wren. All part of the plan, he'd probably tell you. I am not interested in your funny feeling. The dude was always a distant, isolated leader, but this is getting ridiculous. And I'm not gonna ask what the other Snokes are for, because I really don't want to know. <laughs> Although things have been going well militarily under Ren's reign, there are other serious consequences that have materialized. General Hux has since de-evolved into a battered housewife, abused by Ren, and chosen as a patsy for the failure of Starkiller. Such range and power will correct the error of Starkiller Base. A scheme greenlit by the highest leadership. And despite the loss of resources, destroying the New Republic was still a fairly massive victory. They also have Hux to thank for the breakthrough of hyperspace tracking, so how much flack the guy really deserves is debatable. But now a downtrodden Hux has been compelled to become a spy feeding the Resistance intel. The Emperor and his fleet have been hiding in the unknown regions. 
on a world called Exegol. He's probably out of options, considering Ren is ragdolling anyone who simply plays devil's advocate. This fleet, what is it, a gift? What is he asking for in return? Does that make sense? There's also suggestion in the extended canon that Ren intentionally creates infighting as a means of stopping his officers uniting against him. But to me, it seems more likely this policy would bring about the very thing he sought to prevent. Ren needed to be brought to heel. I don't care if you win. I need Kylo Ren to lose. Palpatine is just lucky a pliable First Order still exists at all. He only seems to re-exert control when General Pride swears his fealty. Before we get to the explosions, we're subjected to perhaps the most stupid First Order policy we've seen yet. This moronic captain's medallion thing, which allows any ship to pass any First Order blockade or gain access to any vessel without the usual authentication. This ship could have been a bomb for all they know. It was always easy to infiltrate these ships, but Sheesh, they don't even need to try anymore. And Hux's mental state seems worse than ever, revealing himself to be the First Order traitor when he helps the good guys, then making the disastrous error of coming up with a cover story that still involved betraying the First Order. They overpowered the guards and forced me to take them to their ship. Part of Sidious's convoluted scheme appears to involve him leaving out these Sith MacGuffins for Ren and Rey to find. Rather than taking a more direct approach, he instead sends Ren on a dungeon clearing mission and Rey on an Indiana Jones style escapade. I hate that guy. Just don't ask how the Death Star 2 wasn't obliterated in orbit or how it drifted all the way to this previously unknown planet and landed neatly on its surface still somewhat intact. Because I have no idea. Sidious has also been encouraging Ren to kill Rey even though he needs her. She'll never be a Jedi. Make sure of it. Kill her. Although he actually intends for Rey to kill Ren before coming to Exegol, I think. Just give it to me one more time, simpler. But Ren won't let Rey go to Exegol unless they're both going there to kill Sidious. The only way you're getting to Exegol is with me. I think it's obvious by now that Palpatine cannot predict the future, but he must surely anticipate that Ren would seek to overthrow him and possibly team up with Rey. This all seems unnecessarily risky. This is not going to go the way you think. And it's weird that Palps couldn't find Rey all these years. He ordered Ochi to kill Rey's parents, so he must have been in direct contact and they were making it pretty obvious where they left her. She isn't on Jakku, she's gone. Ochi ended up biting the dust on Burning Man Planet, leaving behind clues to reach the Wayfinder and this little droid which is absolutely packed with Exegol intel. All the information you need for an airstrike on Exegol. Sidious has left a trail of breadcrumbs across the galaxy, leading straight to his supposedly secret planet. And as if it wasn't bad enough, he invited powerful force users to find him, both of whom have good reason to want him dead. He seems to already know this will result in Rey's friends coming along too. She will come, her friends will follow. So he goes all out with his provocation campaign by sending out one of his nifty new goth star destroyers to annihilate Kajimi, transmitting a public broadcast soon after in which he basically declares war on the galaxy. The resistance is dead. The Sith flame will burn. All worlds surrender or die. So surely now Sidious must have his fleet fully deployed and combat ready. Nope, but he does have a whole mess of useless ships, that's for sure. This is where the fun begins. Sidious defies Imperial Convention by not building bigger, but instead distributing powerful weaponry among the fleet. Excellent job, sir! It would almost be a step in the right direction if these Sith Star Destroyers weren't so dangerously flawed. Terrible job, sir! None of these suckers can activate their shields or even fly of their own accord, apparently due to the difficult atmospheric conditions on Exegol. They're all completely reliant on one undefended, piddly little navigation tower to guide them out. The need a left? It doesn't seem like a great time or place to invite your enemies for a battle. Since our shield strength is non-existent, I would not recommend it. Palp should have waited until his Star Destroyers were deployed in orbit, or at the very least, kitted out each ship with its own Exegol navigation system. 
I've seen your daily routine, you're not busy. These ships are so immobile and trapped within their tight formation, a company of first order traders are able to execute a cavalry charge on the decks of the command ship without being threatened by so much as a roll maneuver. But their lack of navigation and maneuverability are nothing when compared to the problems with their weaponry. Enter the Axial Super Lasers, one of the most ridiculously catastrophic weaknesses I think we've ever endured. These weapons present a conveniently large target and they destroy the entire vessel after a modest number of hits. Have these guys been taking notes from the Harfasters? Linked in directly to the ship's reactors, the Final Order has forsaken bigger balls for a total dicks out approach to ship design. It's a weakness so obvious the Rebels figured it out after one brainstorming session. We think hitting the cannons might ignite the main reactors. It's a planet killing weapon, of course it was always going to be the enemy's priority target whether they knew it would destroy the ship or not. And I can't see any pressing need to fit out every single one of these ships with these weapons. Why not scatter this weaponry throughout the fleet, or even better, enclose the super laser within an armoured housing that you can open up when necessary. It's not like you're going to be using this thing very often. But hey, flying around and essentially lighting a bunch of wicks on some flying bombs is still a pretty laborious task. Personally, I would have just gone for one more infiltration mission on a ship at the outskirts of this fleet. The majority of these background Sith Star Destroyers appear to be deaf, dumb and blind. I'm sure it would be easier than ever to get aboard, these vessels are surely undermanned. Then simply aim the Axial Super Laser downwards and blow the whole final order to shit. I mean yeah, it's a suicide mission, but these heroes are up for that. In fact, we should have withheld Withholdo for this, then maybe her death would have actually meant something. The Bridges of these Star Destroyers seem as vulnerable as ever, but obviously this time that's the least of it. With the lead ship destroyed and the navigation signal along with it, the rest of these ships are trapped, leaving the Rebels and their newly arrived civilian allies to mop up. Meanwhile below, Benny Boy shows up in a flying cannon violation and oh look, it's the MIA Knights of Ren. Except now they're the Knights against Ren, but as expected these posers don't live up to the hype. Nearby in his grotto, Sidious hosts a family reunion with Rey, bestowing her the awkward honour of being the weirdest Disney princess ever. He also apparently has enough manpower left to deploy a Sith chair squad, so he gives away the final stage of his plan, encouraging Rey to kill him so he can inhabit her body. Kill me, and my spirit will pass into you. We will be one. Which doesn't sound very appealing even if you were Darkseid, so why would she do that now? He's ruined his own scheme immediately, he barely even tried to turn her to the dark side. he could have just rocked her up a bit, attacked her, then let her strike him down. It is possible this was actually a ruse by Palpatine designed to discourage Rey from killing him in his weakened state, but then that would leave him with no reason to want Rey there in the first place so that wouldn't exactly make things better. It's only by accident he discovers the dyad that can restore him. So after decades of secret planning and preparation and on the verge of galactic conquest, an overconfident Sidious snatches defeat from the jaws of victory by inviting everyone to come take a crack at his fleet that can't fly and his body that can't function, causing the collapse of the entire final order and a grassroots uprising against the remaining first order throughout the galaxy. Does any of this sound familiar? That's because Sidious made a similar balls up in Return of the Jedi when he intentionally provoked the rebels into attacking the unfinished Death Star 2. The greatest teacher failure is. This time though, he gets a slightly more conclusive death when Rey vaporizes her grand palpy and the Sith ghouls apparently with an assist from some dead Jedi. Would it be possible to examine his body? Failing to learn from another past mistake, he should have been well aware of the danger of using force lightning against lightsabers. You might want to rethink your technique. Ben then dies after catching a severe case of cooties from Rey. Random lesbians. Before Rey heads off to bury her mentor's lightsabers at the Lars Homestead massacre site on Tatooine. A planet Rey has nothing to do with, Luke never liked and Leia had no attachment to other than being chained to it for a while. Rey also seems to have duped Chewie and Lando out of inheriting the Millennium Falcon and kidnapped Poe's droid before stealing a famous surname that doesn't belong to her. Wait, this is Sidious, isn't it? At the risk of weakening my own arguments, let's go dark side with our interpretation of this ending. Good. Palps never stipulated Rey had to kill him with a lightsaber, and it's already been established that Sidious has the power to mimic other people's voices telepathically. 
I have been every voice you have ever heard inside your head. He may have been imitating the Jedi, urging her to kill him. These are your final steps, Ray. Rise and take them. So perhaps once again, the Emperor survives to be wheeled out at a time of great financial need. But this time, he's living on in Ray's body. That's right, Raylo just got even weirder. 